morning, good morning. It's early. And I have on shoes this morning for folks. Uh, some folks will get that. I never wear shoes. Um, but thank you all for being here so early. Uh, as Elise uh, talked about, this month's theme is critical. And um, when she first called, um, I had all this good stuff that I wanted to talk about business-wise. And um, I went online to Creative Morning. She read a little bit about the theme and how they come up with it, give you an overview and stuff like that. Um, online on the website has a lot of good images. It has some stories from other Creative Mornings members. Um, and each one of them talked about what critical meant to them. And as I read it, a lot of them use different permutations of the word critical. They use like critique um, or criticize. Every time they did that, it moved a little bit further away from um, like what the word critical means to me. Um, so I felt like I had to level set uh, just a little bit. There was one story about a 911 operator, if you read it online, um, and he talked about how every phone call was critical uh, and things like that. That was the one that was closest to me. So. Um, like I said, when Elise talked about that, I did some research, <laughs> had to get on Google. And um, there are three definitions to that word critical, expressing adverse or disapproving comments or judgments, which is the first one there. Um, and I think that's, you know, criticize. <laughs> we kind of know that. The second one is uh, expressing or involving an analysis of merits in work, faults or work. So that's more critique. Uh, and then the third one that you see here highlighted, a situational problem having the potential to become disastrous, uh, pretty much at a point of crisis. And that is what I think about when I hear critical. That is what critical means to me. So that third definition is what we're going to speak from today, what I'll speak from today. And um, I'm sorry to do this. I'm going to forewarn you now, give you... Um, a little bit of uh, full disclosure here, but I gotta take you here to really convey the feeling that I have when I hear something is critical. That, as an example, is a John Doe or a Jane Doe being at the hospital, the doctor comes out and he tells them that your firstborn child is not gonna make it. Like, that's critical. Um, or your wife, or your, your, your uh, husband, your cousin, whatever it is, right? That is what it means to me to be critical. And because I had the forum today, there were a lot of things before we get into the business and the creativity stuff, um, maybe because of national things, I don't know, it's just a few things that I definitely wanted to touch on because I see them as being critical. Um, it is critical, first image there, I'm just gonna go from these images, um, notes I won't use too much, but it is critical that we start to take our politics seriously. Very critical. Um, I have failed to do that when I think about the grand scheme of things. I think I've been somebody um, that literally just thought I could vote, go vote, and that's it. Um, I've really felt like, oh, it's, we're not gonna let it get that bad. <laughs> um, it's gonna be okay, whatever. Um, you see a few bad press conferences here, um, tiptoe and legal lines there. Uh, and like I said, I think there's always been something deep inside that's like, all right, we're not gonna let it go too far or we're not gonna let it get out of control. Um, I start to see hypocrisy turn into an alternate reality. And then we all watch a few you know, elections, whether they're Senate, House, governor, whatever, you see them go the opposite way. Um, and then it all culminates in some appointments, arguably in the most Supreme Court in the land. Uh, and then what happens? My little nieces, <laughs> young women, they start to lose their rights. And I almost started to feel like it was my fault, like I should have been doing more for women on behalf of my nieces, different things like that. So um, all of this stuff, I always felt like, like I said, it was a game or like it was just going to not get too out of control. And then here we are today. So and I know people are like, oh, oh man, like I'm sitting here talking about politics <laughs> because it's like been taboo historically. Uh, to not talk about politics. I think that historically we've said don't talk about politics in the workplace, uh, in public settings, things like that. And I thought really long and hard about what I was going to open with today. Um, and I can tell you that I think that old way of thinking has to go away. Um, there are literally organizations, nonprofits, B Corps, whatever, that are birthed off of political action. 
So how we got to a point where we don't discuss those things like in certain settings is a little bit beyond me, but we've got to change that a little bit. Um, we know who's talking about it or who's taking it seriously, so we've got to start to do that. And I think that's okay. I mean, we, we live in North Carolina. I have an understanding of, of my state <laughs> and how we vote sometimes. Um, and I'd be naive to think that there are not other people in my circle or people that I do business with that do not have or that have the opposite political beliefs that I do. But I do know that in Raleigh, in North Carolina, we are essentially good people. Uh, and we all have a very good way of working together and putting differences aside. I think that there is an emergence of a third group <laughs> in terms of politics. I don't know if they have a name for this group yet or not. Um, but it's like one of those movies where the two adversaries have to get together to like take out this third adversary that like, like you know, is threatening the world and then we can just get back to arguing or whatever. Um, you know, it's kind of like how uh, Duke and UNC fans do when we see NC State making a run. Um, like in the playoffs or something like that. Um, but I, I am actually fortunate enough to have um, or to have lived through experiences to see people like a John McCain. Um, somebody who I think, you know, has a lot of character, um, the way he governed, the way he served his country. Um, I'll never forget him stopping a lady that was like disrespecting former President Obama for calling him, you know, all this other stuff. Um, and he literally blocked, <laughs> they tried to repeal one of his biggest accomplishments and he blocked it. I'm fortunate enough to see an example like that and to know that on the other side, we can work together um, and put differences aside for the best um, for, for people around us. So um, we've got to start doing that. Um, I say that we need to take our politics seriously. It's critical that we take our politics seriously because they're not. They're not. Um, somebody summed it up the other day. I was looking at something and they said, it's funny that people hate Congress but they love their congressmen. And I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like, that's what we see playing out a lot. Um, it is critical that we do something to end random gun violence. It is not critical that we come up with laws to imprison doctors for performing abortions. And that's just my opinion on that matter, but <laughs> snaps. Um, but I know y'all don't wanna hear me talk about politics uh, all morning. I, I can see the whole room. It's like, oh snap, talking about politics. <laughs> Um, a few, one more, then I'll get into business stuff, but um, the top right picture, anybody know who that is by chance? Is he, they were, there was a documentary recently about black maternal health. Yes, yes, his name is, his name is Bruce McIntyre the third. Beside him is Isaac Rose, or uh, Amber Rose Isaacs, I'm sorry. That documentary recently came out, um, but this story is over two years ago. And they were expecting their first child. They went to the hospital um, and Bruce was adamant that something was wrong. He, he knew that something was, was wrong. He, he, you know, OBGYN visits, doctor visits, I guess the results uh, of certain tests, he could tell that, that things was wrong. He was pleading for help. It's critical that you help the mother of my child here uh, during this birth. Um, they didn't, emergency C-section, she died, she passed away. So now he is um, raising uh, their child on his own. Um, he has started uh, to get, become very active in terms of African-American women and healthcare and um, childbirth. This was two years ago. This has been happening even before then. Very recently, I saw this. We see these documentaries in public spheres. And then I also saw it on uh, CBS recently, where they talked about um, women, childbirth, um, how they're not making it through childbirth, and the alarming stats when it comes to African-American women. It is critical that we start listening to the plight of other people and that we just not, you know, pass it off as just somebody complaining or somebody not listening. It's critical we listen to women, African-American women. It's critical that we listen to black fathers. I know that the uh, 
stigma or the cliche when you hear black fathers and what you may think of, but there are a lot of good men out there who are good fathers, African-American fathers, and when they speak, we probably should listen. You're not gonna get much from the deadbeat dad or something like that. They're not gonna say anything. But when people like that speak, we have to start listening. Um, also, somehow, when we talk about plights, <laughs> everybody has one. Um, somehow, we have um, decided that white men cannot take part in these discussions. You talk about DEI or inclusion or whatever, everybody's so image conscious and we almost want to exclude white men from having these types of discussions as well, from things that um, are going on in their lives, in their plight. And that, you know, something, something with that doesn't quite sit well with me um, when we talk about excluding people. I don't want me asking for my rights to infringe or take away from the rights of someone else. Um, and if you think that white men don't have a plight, you should talk to any number of servicemen, white men, who've served their country, who have gone overseas, put country first only to come back and to be underserved here. Um, so, like I said, when we talk about, you know, plights or listening to people, we need to do it in a way um, that is a little more, more tangible. Plight, getting into my definitions now, <laughs> plight is a dangerous, difficult, or otherwise unfortunate situation. So, like I said, everybody has one. And it is my belief that we only get involved in things that come through our front door. I think that's okay. You know, some people are not gonna understand the things that I talk about because you don't live my life and you're not there, right? And that's cool. Um, but whatever those things are, whatever those issues that are important to you, important to your family, um, I think we've gotten past comments about it or analysis about it, right? We are at that third stage in a lot of different ways. So try to move from speaking about things to doing tangible things that can improve the situation for the, the situations that you care about. I think that's uh, very critical. So just wanted to speak on that real quick. Welcome to Creative Mornings. <laughs> My name is Johnny Hackett Jr. again. Um, now I'm gonna go from the, the bottom two pictures. <laughs> um, I, uh, my name is Johnny Hackett. I started a black owned business directory in 2019, February 2019. It's called Hashtag Black Dollar NC. Um, so Christina, Christina back there. She was with me when I was working on this. Um, I, uh, I was online one day, this was 2018, and I think I was just looking for um, a way to support black owned businesses. I was trying to do a little bit more myself and I just couldn't find them. Um, and I have this skill with design, with development. I've uh, worked for IBM, for Xerox, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and all the IT departments. And I can facilitate every phase of the SDLC process except for a developer, but I know a little bit to be dangerous. Um, <laughs> but I did, des I designed um, a whole directory. I wanted to make it a little more modern, a little more updated. Um, and thankfully, we were able to release it on time, February 1st, uh, for Black History Month in 2019. Um, and the directory has done really well uh, since then. We spent the whole 2019 donating to other businesses, going to other events. We're not a research group. We don't go out and just list businesses online. Uh, you have to come to us, but it's free. Once you sign up, you know, we'll, we'll get you loaded in there. Um, but I did that work for a long time, um, or for that first year in 2019. Got into 2020, well, before that, uh, Nicole Stewart, who's a, a, a dear friend of ours, she spoke for me at a few uh, events for us. I shared, um, or I supported her events. Um, she was coming home from vacation one day, and um, she had her whole family in the car. We were having a release party for the directory. This is like June of 2019, June or July. And um, she pulled her whole family up to the event, made them sit in the car just so she could come in and introduce me to a Veronica Creech, who at that time was the director um, of the city of Raleigh's Economic Development and Innovation Office. And uh, Veronica had just taken that position and Nicole said, hey, you need to meet this person. She's telling me about the makeup of that office 
For those that don't know, that office uh, with the city of Raleigh, their number one job is to support small businesses in the city of Raleigh. But they're a small staff. I think at that time, maybe when they first started, um, maybe three or four employees. I think now they've grown a little bit. They're working with the chamber a lot more now as well. Um, at that time in 2019, very small office. And what they did is they set up these alliances with other organizations in the city of Raleigh. So similar to your district map, you know, like a councilman map or something like that. They had separated the city of Raleigh into these districts and they said, all right, if we fund or support these organizations, they're going to do the work for small businesses on behalf of us. So in turn, if we support them, they support the business owners, right? Everybody heard of DRA, Downtown Raleigh Alliance. They are one of those alliances. Uh, Shop Local Raleigh, Jennifer Martin, very cool, took me under her wing. Um, Glenwood South, uh, five points. There are 11 um, of these alliances at that time. And so we're meeting, they're telling me this story. And then Nicole and Veronica, they say, they say yeah, well, we, we created this map of Raleigh and we've got all this support that, all right, they support this area, they support small business owners in this area. They said, but we forgot online businesses. Online businesses don't fit into a map and you have in, your, in our directory at that time, we had a little over 300 businesses. And they said, you have more businesses in your directory in Raleigh than all of these alliances put together. And by the way, online businesses are almost what? African-American business owners, black owned businesses, right? So at that time, I'm, you know, and again, I don't think this is, it wasn't a, um, it's one of those oversights. It's not intentional. It's just one of those things that happens where you're like, oh damn, we forgot online businesses. They don't fit into a geographical place on this map. So after uh, conversations, after that meeting, uh, we were brought to the table uh, right at the start of 2020 as an alliance member with the city of Raleigh. Very uh, big accomplishment for us, for somebody that just, you know, created a directory online. It's not a lot of, um, you know, automation. It's very manual. Uh, but it works and um, we do a lot of support on behalf of small business owners, African-American business owners. So we brought to the table as an alliance member. Our first meeting was at the end of January in 2020. Uh, we were introduced there as an alliance member, Bill King from DRA. I'll never forget it. You know, you're in a space like that and you're like the only African-American person there. Um, you kind of feel a little imposter syndrome. You feel a little out of place. Um, soon as the meeting was over, Bill King came right up like gave me one of those, you know, LeBron James daps. And, um, you know, we, we hit it off very, very well. We've been, been cool ever since. But he really made me feel comfortable. And I was ready to work. And they said, you know, we're going to meet once a month. Uh, we're going to come down here and we're going to get this work in. Um, I'm excited. I'm ready to celebrate with the team. And then like a month later, COVID happened. And everything shut down. And then those meetings went from once a month to three times a week. As someone who, again, historically has not been at the table when you talk about city government or your, your officials or whatever, you do have a tendency to feel like, you know, they're not doing enough or they're not thinking for you or for others. When I tell you that this Alliance group and the city of Raleigh team showed up three times a week, every week, and through 2020, it was like October when we stopped those meetings, from March through October, every week on these calls trying to figure it out. What, are we, what should we be doing? Misinformation, all this information here, what do we do here? We're literally trying to figure that stuff out and I, I got a brand new perspective <laughs> on things now after going through that and working with a lot of close allies uh, here in the city of Raleigh. So that was good for me. It was good for us because we did a lot of good work during that time. Um, we did a lot of uh, drives. We raised a lot of money for folks who were shut down. We had a lot of uh, serious conversations amongst each other because if you remember 2020, not only did we have a health pandemic, but we had a social pandemic that summer that happened as well. Um, and parts of Raleigh were on fire, literally. <laughs> I remember I was there um, and we had a lot of, of real conversations. It was critical for us that we had these conversations because things were literally at a point of crisis for us. Um, we did a lot of that good work. Um, 
we made it through. We had some successes. We had some losses. Um, but our downtown after that summer was just atrocious. Um, businesses had left because of um, shutdown reasons, because of the health pandemic. Businesses were torn down because of that summer and protests and opportunists, whatever we call them. Um, and once again, DRA, myself, uh, city of Raleigh, we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we start to bring back our downtown? You know, we don't want to be accused of coming out the house too early because again, you've got two sides when you, dealing with this health pandemic has been the worst <laughs> because you have multiple sides of things. You have folks health on one side and then you have the vitality of your city <laughs> on the other hand. Um, and we've got all this space, all this stuff downtown that just looks like it's in ruin. And we're like, we gotta do something. How do we start to bring this stuff back? We have these conversations about this uh, temporary pop-up space. Um, we, we, we're doing a lot of markets, Black Flea Market, actually, in the front row. Um, Black Flea Market, who we partnered with um, in late 2019, um, we always had these thoughts of doing these market events. So going, we, we can't get real estate. Again, it's hard for us to get a storefront. So, hey, let's just go find an outdoor location. Let's just rent a location, tell of all, all of our vendors to come out and sell their products, right? It's a perfect, perfect idea. Way to take a directory from, a, um, from an online thing to a physical place. Um, but when we saw Black Flea Market and the flair that they had, I didn't want to do it anymore. We just supported them. I think we got to do a lot better with that. Um, so we, I, never did another, I never did a market event. I just invested in them. And so they had been doing it for a very long time, a lot of successful events. Um, and then we put together this plan, DRA, City of Raleigh, and we say, all right, we're going to open a temporary pop-up shop downtown Raleigh. Uh, they connected me with Empire uh, Properties. Um, I think it was critical for Empire to do something because they, they, sent me in a, they sent me an email and they said, hey, here are six addresses that are vacant that are just sitting there. Take your pick. <laughs> Point of crisis. No money coming in. <laughs> like all of their spaces are vacant. And as a, as a real estate developer, as someone who owns real estate, again, I know that's a plight that you may have. So they sent us six addresses. We're riding around Raleigh like it's a scavenger hunt. Um, we get to 23 West Hargett Street and it's like, that's it. Like that's the one right at the corner, right? Um, so we go into that empire. I always salute empire for this, um, just as a, uh, for their, cre their creativity and how they came up with uh, structuring the lease for us. Um, but they said, hey, we'll do, we'll do three months I know this is a new concept that you're working on. If it doesn't work after three months, roll out. Don't worry about it. You know what I'm saying? We'll, we'll, this doesn't go into a long-term thing. You're not gonna be held on the hook for anything. Um, we're even gonna give it to you at a super discounted rate because it's just sitting there making zero at that point. Um, but if it does work after three, week, or three months, um, we'll let it roll into a multi-year uh, thing. And you know, getting ahead of the story, but we're going on our second year now. So I think that should tell you that it works. Um, so Black Friday Market is a store in downtown Raleigh that we allow small business owners to sell their products commission free. And when I say that, everybody, the first thing, well, how do you make money? What, if, what are you doing? Like, well, we charge them a flat fee up front to have their products in the store for a month, two months, three months, whatever you choose. And then we don't take a dime. You get 100% of the sales that happen. We've, we've just eclipsed over 600,000 in sales that have gone back to small business owners, many of which probably about 70% in Raleigh, uh, between Raleigh and Durham. And um, the store is doing well. It's, it's one of the first um, stores with that model where you don't take a, a commission. There are a lot of consignment type stores, but not many or not any, um, at least here with that particular model. So. Um, the piece with the store um, that's always interesting is everyone always thinks that it's only black owned businesses in the store. And it's because we came from the directory. Jasmine, raise your hand. <laughs> we're having a meeting one day 
and I talked about the importance of having access to have a storefront. We've done the legwork. We are going to open doors for other people who don't have these connections and can't sell their products or get a storefront. The only thing is, I don't want it to be just for African Americans. We have to change the name from Black Dollar and see the directory, which is for African Americans, have to change the name of the store. And Jasmine named the store Black Friday Market. Came up with a great name. Um, that's a good job. However, <laughs> like I said, everybody always thinks that the store is just for African American business owners, and that's not the case. The majority of the products there are from African-American business owners, probably about 90, 93%, because we can't get over the hump of, of, of not being perceived as just a store for African-American business owners. Our goal with the storefront, and it was critical for this, was to provide access to small business owners who do not have a physical retail place to sell their products. We don't care about your background. We don't care about your demographic. Do you have products <laughs> Come into the store? Um, but the store has been doing well. When we, when we launched it, we did get 100 applications the first day. Um, the directory was used as one of the primary means of communication. We had already been, if you thought to yourself, oh, I'm going to open up a consignment store, the first thing you would think to yourself is, I got to put together a list of businesses to reach out to. Well, we had been doing that since February 1st of 2019. So once we sent the email blast out, like I said, 100 business owners came calling that first day. We opened the store um, in 13 days, got the key December 2nd, opened the doors December 15th. That is, that is awesome to a, a full store, right? So that is good. Um, doing a lot of good work, a lot of, uh, blessed to have a lot of publicity. Um, other partners that we've had through Seedspot, uh, DRA, again, Shop Local Raleigh, they've all uh, supported us. Visit Raleigh as well, throw them in there. Um, we apply for this grant, uh, when was it? June of last year. Partners in, C in DC called C Spot, their top five business accelerator. They hit us up in June. They said, hey man, Walmart has this grant supporting African American business owners in retail. We think you would be perfect to partner with. And I'm like, all right, cool, you know, it's, it won't hurt us to apply for it. So we spend a couple months um, applying for this grant. At the same time, also in June of last year, a um, good friend of mine, David Meeker, invites me to this huge space behind Trophy Brewing. Um, and he invites me there just to, like, as a, hey, can you tell me what I should be doing with this space? Um, give me some ideas on how I should be using this space. Um, David Meeker is actually somebody who is one of the first users of the directory, Black Dollar, when we launched it in 2019. Me and him had this virtual relationship because if he couldn't find what he needed on the directory, he would email me. And he said, hey, do you have any uh, Black-owned landscapers? I don't know, I'll check, but thank you for emailing. Um, and so we had this virtual like, relationship for a little while, then we end up um, you know, meeting each other through the story, love what we did there, he loved our ideas. Um, and again, he brought us in as a thought leader to look at this huge space and what he should be doing. And I'm in there telling him all these ideas and what you should do here. Um, but secretly, I'm like, man, I want that building. <laughs> like, I left out, you know, I, in the store, I had this living room where I used to sit behind the, the checkout and have my laptop, but people would come up and bother me. I'm like, man, I need like, we, like our team is growing. We need like office space. We need um, different things like that. And then a lot of the business owners that we're working with at Black Friday Market, they're creating products at their house, in the kitchen, in the garage, kids running around, no focus, TV's on, oh, let me sit down for a minute. And then you just get warped out, right? Um, business owners needed a place to create their products. But it was a huge ticket for that build. I didn't know how I was going to do it. Continue on, October. Zach, who's the executive director of C-Spot, he calls me up. He says, hey, bro, we got the grant. <laughs> I said, what? Oh, my goodness. That was perfect timing. <laughs> <Whatever that was. laughs> I was like, oh, man, we got the grant, man. What do we oh, my goodness. And I asked him, I said, so, you know, we're already self-sufficient at the store. Um, the model is working. We can take care of staff, take care of overhead. We do our own events. 
do our own marketing. Um, do you think they would have a problem with me rolling those funds into a new facility? And he's like, well, actually, as part of this grant, you have to open new facilities <laughs> or else we don't get it. <laughs> so I'm like, All right, cool, cool. So I called David up. I called David and he says, I said, yo, man, we uh, sign us up. We're coming in there. And he's like, huh? What? Like completely took him by surprise. And so what we did is we took a co-working model and we applied it to retail business owners. So we took all this money and we invested it directly in them again. We put heat press, probably thousand, over twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of equipment in this facility. Um, heat press machines for garments, uh, mugs, hats, laser engravers. You can do glass, wood, ceramic. The, the shot glasses you get on vacation, you can literally make those there. Um, uh, what else? Uh, electric heaters uh, for candle making, uh, soap, skincare products. We've got this huge photography room, videography room, um, podcast room, whatever. Um, just a huge facility with all of the things in there that a creative person in retail would need to come in and make their products. And that's just phase one. We got a whole other list of equipment that we want to bring in. Um, but we decided to give creatives a space to come and use their products. Again, change the name of it. It's called The Factory. We don't want anyone to think that it's only for African-American business owners. But yes, everyone knows our target audience and who we serve. Uh, but these places are open for everyone. So we opened the factory just this year, uh, about mid-April, um, late April, something like that. Um, and I haven't slept since. That's basically me. <laughs> In the, uh, the bottom right picture, that's been me now with the directory and the store and now this, this 10,000 square foot space called the factory. Um, and uh, it, it's good, but the thing in business is as we've grown and as we've gotten more things this year, we've actually lost key people on our team. So it's like we're growing and we're getting more things, but we're losing key people on our team. And the best practices that we've always had, some of the internal process. I'm a process guy, um, historically, in corporate America. I'll talk bad about corporate America later, but you can learn a lot from corporate America. I've learned a lot that I apply to what I'm doing as an entrepreneur. I'm a Six Sigma black belt, and I use that every day in my entrepreneurship life, and I'm a process-driven guy. We have good processes. We've built them into our system, but when you don't have the people to um, uh, carry out those processes, all hell's gonna break loose. <laughs> and so we've lost folks this year, um, you know, as we've grown a little bit. And going back to when Elise called me to do Creative Mornings, and she said, oh, we're talking about critical. I said, oh yes, I have something great to talk about, critical, because we're just like, you know, going on two years, it's like terrible twos with kids where they're really bad when they're two years old. Um, I, I think probably most businesses, physically located businesses or storefronts, in two years, you're going to be tested. If you can make it two years, you know, you'll probably be fine after that. So, you know, I'm up here and I'm talking about all this success, but it's very critical for us right now. Time sensitive, urgent. I put that there because Jasmine, Jay, the other folks who are around us, Ken, Kim, I see them here from TDS Radio, LOI. If they've heard me talk around the factory in meetings, there have been two things that is killing us right now as a small business. It's critical that we fix these things. Communication, our communication with each other or our communication externally, and our sense of urgency. We talk about things, we've, we've fallen back into bad habits of talking about things, but not having the sense of urgency to follow through with it. And while I'm super humbled to, to be invited here uh, and to speak, I'm just like everybody else here. And we, like I said, I share that with you because that's where we are right now. Like it is critical that we solve these things so that our business continues and that we continue to help all of these business owners through our platforms. So um, that piece, when it comes to that sense of urgency, that goes back to that 
that third definition. We've already talked enough. Again, we've talked, we've analyzed enough, we've critiqued, we've criticized. We've got to move to like, you know, tangible type of action and stop feeling like this. That's, I swear, that, that picture, man, the bottom right. <laughs> every time I look at it, I, it's like, and they know that's like me every day, right? Um, but the, the main message though, is that even going through all of that, even with me looking like that every day, every day we get through it. Every day we end up getting through it and we're still here. And talking to the group of entrepreneurs out here, um, the business owners, small business owners, even if you're in a career in corporate, whatever it may be, um, I want you to know that it is critical um, that you not be so down on yourself, that you get out of your own way. Remember that you're gonna be fine. Um, I believe in you so much so that I would open a store and not have a single product in the store. I don't sell products in that store. <laughs> that store is for other business owners to sell their products, but that's how much I believe in you. I was talking to this guy at the factory and he came by, he did a tour, and he saw the podcast room in the videography room. And uh, he's a bartender, I think, at Morgan Street. And he was saying, he was just like, man, this is just like awesome. He's like, man, I just, uh, you know, I want to get this pod thing cast go podcast thing going, man. But I'm just, you know, I don't know. And this, that, and the third. And I said, well, listen, man, I believe in you enough to sign this huge lease. <laughs> I, don't do, I don't do podcasts. <laughs> I don't know anything about heat press machines or like any of that stuff. Like I believe in you, man. So you got to believe in yourself. You're going to let me fail because you don't believe in yourself and you don't want to use these spaces that we're literally providing for everybody else. <laughs> like you have to get out of your own way um, and move forward to try to be successful, man. We had a, um, a pitch competition this past weekend um, and there was a guy, Lamont, worked for a uh, volunteer with an organization called Stars Behind Bars. And what they do is they go into prisons and they're actually able to take people who are about to get out, they can take them out of the prison and actually take them places to, get, to begin to get them reacclimated to society. Um, and this brother, man, he did not want to pitch. He did not want to get up there and talk about his business. They're not going to listen to me. He got gold fronts in his mouth and he's this, that, and the third. And we're talking through stuff and he tells me that anybody that has gone through their program, 100% of those brothers have not gone back to jail. And he is one of them. I said, dude, <laughs> I said, dude, what are you talking about? Why are you so nervous, man? Anyway, he gets up there, he, he presents, of course, he's not as, as sharp as some of the other presenters. Um, you know, I had to ask him some questions to get him to really talk about stuff. He's forgetting key things to talk about. We invited some judges over and the judges, you know, they were downstairs. Oh, they, the judges so weak. They were like, oh, everybody wants to win. We need to give everybody a prize. Like, oh, like <laughs> they understand only one person, only one person can win, but you know. Um, but they're having that conversation and we're trying to figure out how to provide a prize to everybody because there was only one. But Victor Vines with Vines Architecture, I don't know if you all have heard of him, but this guy's like top notch right here in Raleigh. Um, Victor Vines was so compelled by his speech and the work that he does that he threw in an extra $5,000. So, when we say that it's critical for you as entrepreneurs or business owners, whatever, to get out of your own way, you don't know who you will inspire. I get messages all the time from people, hey man, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate you sharing that, man. You, you, you made my day, you got me, I'm about to keep going. I'm looking like this. <laughs> <laughs> While I'm sharing the message, like. <laughs> But then somebody else sees it and then they and it makes their day. It makes them keep going, man. So, you know, you have to you have to keep doing these things. I, I think I'm probably at time. You got to push yourself forward. I told you we get back to this, but it is critical that we start to change the world. I think we do that 
by everybody here individually in your own tangible way, you start to change Raleigh, Durham, Cary, this area. I wanted to do a directory that was the United States wide, but through council, I decided to only focus on North Carolina because I have to take care of uh, ba uh, Big Boy from Outcast. Anybody listen to Outcast? <laughs> Big Boy has a famous line. You want to change the world, start with your corner. All right. So if we're going to do that, we got to start to do that here. So I challenge everybody here today. That's what we'll end on. I think I got to do questions. Um, but thank you all for listening. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all for waking up so early. So we are going to open the floor to some questions. We have about we have time for a few questions. So um, raise your hand if you have something to ask Tony. Sorry about that. Um, I, I think, I think you have to, I, I told someone else that I think the greatest, uh, trait or strength that any of us can have is empathy. Um, and I think that if you start to think about things from other sides of the table, it's going to allow you to uh, frame things in a certain way that is not, uh, necessarily, um, you know, disrespectful or off brand or off subject for it the other people you're trying to talk to. Um, the example I gave earlier about um, the city of Raleigh and this breakdown of physically located businesses, um, I was able to not go into it like, oh, you just don't care about online businesses or black owned businesses. No, I can s see from that perspective and understand what this small office was trying to do, like physically, um, and then be able to speak to it from that. Um, I, I think it starts with that empathy, though. Again, I think if we're able to think um, about, again, the plight of others and what other people are going through, it's always going to put you in a position to frame things the right way. Um, I, I feel like I have a very good ability um, to do that, and that's what's helped me. So. <laughs> the gram. Uh, a photo with very little context that was just sort of a text. Raleigh is dying. Very little context. Yeah. I, I would just love to know your response to that. Ah, I. <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> let me see. I'm gonna go back. <laughs> That's probably, uh, that's, that's probably the best response. Um, I love that mural. I love the picture I took right there. Um, I, I, you know, again, going back to, you know, empathy. I don't know who that person is or what it is that they're going through. There may be something that is, um, needs to be improved, <laughs> whatever that situation is, um, or whatever prompts them to say uh, something like that. Um, I don't believe that. Um, like I, I've said this before, I don't think that any city is without its issues. Um, I think that Raleigh is far along. I think that we, I, I like to hope that we're a lot better than other folks. Um, we do have to fit, fix communication. Um, I do think that there is, um, a, uh, it's like a network of information that circulates and I, we got to figure out how to get information for specific things to everyone. I think that's one of the biggest things we brought to the table with the city of Raleigh. Uh, no offense, they're not on the gram. <laughs> the city, they don't have the biggest presence on, on social media, right? Um, but so when we got aligned to the city, we were able to get on the gram and talk about 
programs or funding or things that they've had. And again, some of the best messages I get are, man, I wouldn't have known about Launch Raleigh if it wasn't for your post or whatever, right? Like so, um, but we still gotta do better with that here in Raleigh and making sure that everybody's included in certain information. So, you know, I don't think Raleigh's perfect, but I don't think we're dying either. So um, I have to disagree. <laughs> Yeah, props to you, Johnny, for that, because I woke up this morning with one of the first things I saw. I laughed, closed Instagram, and came here. Because so, <laughs> I think it was a bit of a joke, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. To see some of this. But it does get to my question, which is, you said it's critical about communication. Yes. If you need communication. I'd love to hear you elaborate on that, because I think there are communication tools in the city um, that can help businesses like yours or everyone Right. Um, but I just love to hear you elaborate. You kind of hinted at it, and I was like, I want to hear more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you mean? Like, what do you need from everyone in this room from a communication perspective to help you, to help those businesses that you're helping, yeah. and to help probably not die? You know? Right, right. No, exactly, exactly. Well, like, like I said, with the, you take your city, city of Raleigh, um, chamber, DRA, whatever, right? All of these organizations that, are, that exist in Raleigh, um, the first piece of it is like, how do we get some of that key information out to everybody? How do we meet people in spaces that we, didn't, we don't normally go in, whether physically or digitally? Um, so that's something that we've been thinking about for a very long time. Um, and I don't necessarily know the answer there on how we fix that, um, but somehow, some way, we've got to corral all this information and make sure it's in the right place. Uh, Mark Weldon, with the city of Raleigh, we had our end of year meeting last year. And um, it was kind of like, all right, you know, we recap and everything we did this year, what is our focus going into next year? And I told him that the focus for us was small business owner education. And that everybody has done webinars or seminars, whether it's us, whether it's like I say, uh, DRA, whether it's this group, that group, everybody's done all these webinars about whether it be capital or funding, PPP stuff, it doesn't matter, right? But there's not one place where a business owner can go and get all of that content. That content is literally everywhere, spread everywhere. And I told Mark that we need to work on something um, to get all of this information in one place. Where's the one place a small business owner goes um, to get all of that, to capture all of that? Now, I speak on behalf of entrepreneurs. That's what we've dedicated our life to supporting, whether you're African-American entrepreneur, small business, woman owned, doesn't matter, right? Um, but that's the, typically the perspective I speak from. Um, a little deeper when it comes to African-American business owners, black owned businesses, we, we need to get in alignment because we're just like not connected as much as we should be. This person over here is doing that, that person over there is doing this. We still have this sense of um, competition amongst each other. And now I, somebody came into the store one day and they were asking me these like sneak questions about the store and about like how the store worked and all this stuff. But I was going into like detail about back end. You better use QR codes because if you don't scan stuff, you're going to have, you know, messed up reports and all this stuff. I'm going in depth behind the scenes about how the store operates. And finally, it comes out from them that they had thought about doing something like this before and they didn't do it. And so I looked at them and I said, well, you should. You should do it like right now <laughs> because hopefully this store shows you that it would work. We can't service everybody. So why do I want to be the only one with a store like this? I'm happy for you to go open a similar store because we can't service everybody. I don't if you're trying to chase us, you're already losing because I'm already five years ahead. <laughs> so like we don't worry about too much of that. But Amongst black owned businesses, African American leaders, and we have this conversation a lot, how do we get on the same page? At least mentioned that I've had the privilege to be on all these boards now. I'm on the board of directors at a place at the table, um, Dogwood State Bank, DRA, um, and all of these boards are a machine. They get together once a month, they talk about tangible results, they talk about key things. Oh, you know what you're doing over there. You know what we're doing over there. And I'm like, man, we need to, we need to bring that back 
you know, for um, black owned businesses, because we're just everywhere. We're just like all over the place and we just need a little bit better alignment in our communication. Um, first black mayor of Raleigh, Clarence Leitner, um, owns a funeral home, Leitner Funeral Home, or it used to be MLK Boulevard. When he was mayor on the top floor, he used to have what was called an oval table game. And he would meet with all of the African-American leaders in the city of Raleigh. Anybody that had a business or a lawyer or a doctor or this leader or whatever, and they would talk every month and talk about the plight of African-Americans and what the city needed to be doing at that time. And they would put a plan of action in place and go do it. And we just need to bring something back like that. So it's a little bit about communication. <laughs> yeah.